Today we once again uh, revisit our theme, Hope, Love, Gather in Christ. And our theme verse uh, will once again be drawn from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our thanks to the chorale for whetting our appetite for the musical feast to come this weekend, Christmas at Concordia. And we certainly pray God's blessings on all of you who will be a, a part of that this weekend. Uh, two sellout crowds, I understand, for tonight and tomorrow night, and a wonderful way for uh, our campus to, to celebrate Christmas. Well, it has come down to the very end. And to practically any observer, the situation looks kind of bleak. You've more or less fumbled your way through everything up to this point, and now, now the clock is ticking down to the last few moments, and you're scrambling, scrambling like mad to finish well. But there doesn't seem to be much hope of pulling this out. What do you do? You punt? Throw in the towel? Give up? You know, I have this recurring nightmare, and I'm back in school. And uh, sometimes it's junior high school, sometimes it's high school, but suddenly it's, it's the last day, and I'm scheduled to take a final exam, and usually it's a math class. The only trouble is, I have not attended said class for weeks, for months, and I haven't done any of the work. Somehow I really messed up, and now I'm faced with this desperate, this hopeless situation. What do I do? I fail. And perhaps my nightmare too closely resembles the reality of what you're experiencing right now, wide awake. Pinch yourself, you're not sleeping. The end approaches, and you may be in deep trouble. You, you're going down, and it appears there's absolutely no way that you can pull this thing out. No amount of last-minute scrambling is going to make any difference at all. What do you do? Punt? Throw in the towel? Give up? Do you fail? Some might see this as the hour of darkness, the end of the line, the, the day of final reckoning. Others, on the other hand, may look at this nightmare, this, this train wreck, this desperate situation, and call it Tebow time. <laughs> That's right, Tebow time. For those of you who don't know the phenomenon to which I refer, let me tell you about Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow is the Denver Broncos quarterback. Full disclosure, for those unaware, I am a lifelong Denver Bronco fan. I'm now a fan of Tim Tebow's too. But any follower of the National Football League will tell you that Tim Tebow has been a remarkable story this season, written off by nearly every expert as being without the requisite skills to play quarterback in the NFL. Tebow began this season mired deep on the Broncos' depth chart, unlikely to see any game action. Bronco fans, however, wanted to give this guy a chance. After all, he was a very successful collegiate player. He won the Heisman Trophy, a couple of national championships at the University of Florida. And besides, what did the team have to lose? With a dismal 1-4 and four start, the coaches finally relented and put Tim Tebow on the field. And in every game that he has started, Tebow has usually lived down to the reputation that he had as a quarterback with too many deficiencies to be successful, and the team has consistently fallen behind for, for half to three quarters of the game. But six times 
in seven tries, Tebow has led the Broncos with late game heroics to victory and even to a, a tie for first place in the division, a legitimate chance at the playoffs. And Denver's not merely one. Last, late last minute, fourth quarter, come from behind, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, heart-stopping thrillers. Some say miracles. Maybe they say that because Tim Tebow is a strong Christian young man, an outspoken witness to his faith in Jesus Christ. Some ridicule him for that. In fact, lots of people ridicule him for that. Others joke that maybe God is intervening on his behalf. Indeed, the only game that Tebow lost was against Detroit, in which a a lion player mocked his public practice of of bending to a knee and praying. Some analysts now call that Tebowing. But look what's happened to the Lions since that game, and that guy Tebowed (laughs) mocking Tim. It hadn't gone real well for them. You mess around with Tebow at your peril. God is on his side. You know, one religion scholar, in fact, from Boston University, just this past week, published a little tongue-in-cheek comparison uh, on CNN's website. He said, Jesus turned a ragtag band of 12 apostles into the number one religion in the world. Tebow turned a ragtag squad of 11 football players into an NFL juggernaut. Jesus prayed a lot to God. Tebow prays a lot to Jesus. Jesus ran the money changers out of the temple. Tebow runs the spread option. Jesus miraculously saved a wedding at Cana by turning water into wine. Tebow miraculously led the Broncos to last-second victories against the Dolphins, Jets, Chargers, and Vikings. Coincidence? You be the judge. It's all kind of silly, I know. But for Bronco fans like me, Tim Tebow gives us hope. And we're loving the, the team's resurgence. And we gather around the TV each week to see how Tebow might win this one for us. And we're Tebowing that he does. Hope, love, gather in Tim Tebow. We trust. I suspect that this, uh, this too corny for Hollywood scripts will not have the kind of ending that Denver fans might want to see. Much as the Bronco faithful hope for a Super Bowl victory would love to see Tebow succeed and gather to watch as this plot continues to unfold, we realize that our dreams are not likely to have super happy ending. In fact, nightmare still remains a distinct possibility. Packer people envision a much more plausible scenario of back-to-back world championship success. There are only true believers, no skeptics when it comes to Green Bay's quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is the real deal. And when the final gun sounds at the end of this year's Super Bowl, we believe that Aaron will once again hoist up the the Vince Lombardi trophy yet again. But we don't know for sure. And it's entirely possible that we will have a deflating, depressing, discouraging defeat along the way. And that's just the thing about one of America's most popular religions, big-time sports. Usually our experiences don't turn out the way that we hope that they will. The National Football League is, is a surrogate spirituality for many. Sunday, all through the season, worship occurs, in shrines like Lambo, And when we go, we all know the liturgy, when to stand up, when to sit down. We know the chants. We know when to speak in unison. We know when to reply to prompts responsibly. Sunday is the holy day, and we hold it sacred. And for many, it fills a a spiritual void in their lives. People gather with like-minded congregants who love their team and hope for victory. Gather, love, hope. And sometimes they even get what they want. But the appetite for meaning is filled only with empty calories. And endings often bring 
disappointment. We need something more substantial, more meaningful to fill up those empty places in our lives. We need something more reliable to hold on to in, in the hour of darkness at the end of the line on that day of final reckoning. Our theme verse from Hebrews for this year begins with the end in mind. And the hope that we hold on to without wavering, and the love and good works that we stir up in one another, and the gathering of ourselves together in, in worship are all the ways that we encourage one another as the day draws near. The day, the final day, is drawing near and it's drawing nearer with each passing day. And when that day comes, and it is coming, we'll look back on how we have more or less fumbled our way through. And no amount of last-minute scrambling to make up for previous poor performance is going to help us to make the grade. And left on our own, we might as well punt, throw in the towel, give up. But that's exactly why all of this hoping and loving and gathering is so important to us along the way. Because it encourages us and reminds us that we know, that we know what's going to happen. We know for sure, for absolute certain. He promised. He is faithful. And we watch with Advent anticipation as the story unfolds, knowing exactly how it's going to turn out. The champion enters the field. He's the same one who stepped up before. Remember the last time? All appeared lost. All of us were. Defeat appeared imminent. He was hung out there to die. And bleak turned black as his time expired and he breathed his last. It was finished. But just when hope was splattered and love seemed shattered and those who gathered scattered and we didn't have a Tebow in the world. Jesus rose triumphant from the dead. He comes again. He's coming back. When, not if, when he returns in glory there will be no doubt. When, not if, when Jesus comes again, there will be no disappointment. When the last day, the everlasting day dawns, our fumbles will be forgotten and our faults will be forgiven because Jesus will not fail us. We will not be failed. Good news on the last day of a semester. We will not be failed. Good news on the last day of that draws near. Until then, we hope without wavering. We love one another through service and good works. We, we gather to encourage each other in Christ, for he who promised is faithful. And we hope and we love and we gather in his name.